The Search Party's Finds by Grant Allen The Search Party's Find I can stand it no longer. I must put down my confession on paper, since there is no living creature left to whom I can confess it. The snow is drifting fiercer than ever today against the cabin. The last biscuit is almost finished. My fingers are so pinched with cold I can hardly grasp the pen to write with. But I will write. I must write. I am writing. I cannot die with the dreadful story unconfessed upon my conscience. It was only an accident. Most of you who read this confession perhaps will say, but in my own heart I know better than that. I know it was murder, a wicked murder. Still, though my hands are very numb and my head swimming with delirium, I will try to be coherent, to tell my story clearly and collectedly. I was appointed surgeon of the Cotopaxi in June 1880. I had reasons of my own, sad reasons, for wishing to join an Arctic expedition. I didn't join it, as most of the other men did, from pure love of danger and adventure. I am not a man to care for that sort of thing on its own account. I joined it because of a terrible disappointment. For two years I had been engaged to Dora. I needn't call her anything but Dora. My brother, to whom I wish this paper sent, but whom I daren't address as dear Arthur, how could I, a murderer, will know well enough who I mean, and to all the other people it isn't needful that they should know anything about it. But whoever you are, whoever finds this paper, I beg of you, I implore you, I adjure you, do not tell a word of it to Dora. I cannot die unconfessed, but I cannot let the confession reach her. If it does, I know the double shock will kill her. Keep it from her. Tell her, only he is dead, dead as his post, like a brave man, on the Cotopaxi exploring expedition. For mercy's sake, don't tell her that he was murdered, that I murdered him. I had been engaged, I say, two years to Dora. She lived in Arthur's parish, and I loved her. Yes, in those days I loved her purely, devotedly, innocently. I was innocent then myself and i really believe good and well-meaning i should have been genuinely horrified and indignant if anybody had ventured to say that i should end by committing a murder it was a great grief to me when i had to leave arthur's parish and my father's parish before him to go up to london and take post as a surgeon to a small hospital i couldn't bear being so far away from dora and at first dora wrote to me almost every day with the greatest affection heaven forgive me if i still ventured to call her dora her so good and pure and beautiful and i a murderer but after a while I noticed slowly that Dora's tone seemed to grow colder and colder, and her letters less and less frequent. Why should she have begun to cease loving me, I cannot imagine. Perhaps she had a premonition of what possibly wickedness was really in me. At any rate, her coldness grew at last so marked that I wrote and asked Arthur whether he could explain it. Arthur answered me, a little regretfully, and with brotherly affection. He is a good fellow, Arthur, and that he could. He feared. It was painful to say so but he feared Dora was beginning to love a new lover. A young man had lately come to the village of whom she had a great deal, and who was handsome and brave and fascinating. Arthur was afraid he could not conceal from me his impression that Dora and the stranger were very much taken with one another. At last one morning a letter came to me from Dora. I can put it in here because I carried it away with me when I went to Hammerfest to join the Cotopaxi, and ever since I have kept it sadly in my private pocket-book. Dear Ernest, she had always called me Ernest since we had been children together, and she couldn't leave it off even now when she was writing to let me know she no longer loved me. Can you forgive me for what I am going to tell you? I thought I loved you till lately, but then I had never discovered what love really meant. I have discovered it now, and I find that, after all, I only liked you very sincerely. You will have guessed before this that I love somebody else, who loves me in return with all the strength of his whole nature. I have made a grievous mistake, which I know will render you terribly unhappy. But it is better so than to marry a man whom I do not really love with all my heart and soul and affection. Better in the end, I am sure, for both of us. I am too much ashamed of myself to write you more. Can you forgive me? Yours, Dora. I could not forgive her then, though I loved her too much to be angry. I was only broken-hearted, thoroughly stunned and broken-hearted. I can forgive her now, but she could never forgive me, heaven help me. I only wanted to get away, anywhere, anywhere, and forget all about it in a life of danger. So I asked for the post of surgeon to Sir Paxton Bateman's Cotopaxi Exposition a few weeks afterwards. They wanted a man who knew something about natural history and deep-sea dredging, and they took me on at once, on the recommendation of a well-known man of science. The very day I joined the ship at Hammerfest in August, I noticed immediately that there was one man on board whose mere face and bearing and manner were at first sight excessively objectionable to me. He was a handsome enough young fellow, one Harry Lamarchant, who had been a planter in Queensland, and who, after being burned up with three years of tropical sunshine, was anxious to cool himself, apparently by a long winter of Arctic gloom. 
handsome as he was with his black moustache and big dark eyes rolling restlessly i took an instantaneous dislike to his cruel thin lip and cold proud mouth the moment i looked upon him if i had been wise i would have drawn back from the expedition at once it is a foolish thing to bind oneself down to a voyage of that sort unless you are perfectly sure beforehand that you have at least no instinctive hatred of any one among your messmates in that long forced companionship but i wasn't wise and i went on with him from the first moment even before i had spoken to him i disliked the merchant very soon i grew to hate him he seemed to me the most recklessly cruel and devilish creature god forgive me i should say that i had ever met within my whole lifetime on an arctic expedition a man's true nature soon comes out mine certainly did and he lets his companions know more about his inner self in six weeks than they could have possibly learned about him in years of intercourse under other circumstances and the second night i was on board the cotopaxi i learnt enough to make my blood run cold about harry le merchant's ideas and feelings we were all sitting on deck together those of us who were not on duty and listening to yarns from one another as idle men will when the conversation happened accidentally to turn on queensland and le marchant began to enlighten us about his own doings while he was in the colony he boasted a great deal about his prowess as a disperser of the black fellows which he seemed to consider a very noble sort of occupation there was nobody in the colony he said who had ever dispersed so many blacks as he had and he'd like to be back there dispersing again for in the matter of sport it beat kangaroo hunting or any other kind of shooting he had ever yet tried his hands at all to pieces the second lieutenant hepworth patterson a nice kind-hearted young scotchman looked up at him a little curiously, and said, "'Why, what do you mean by dispersing the merchant? Driving them off into the bush, I suppose, isn't that it? Not much fun in that, that I can see, scattering a lot of poor, helpless, black, naked savages.' The merchant curled his lip contemptuously. He didn't think much of Patterson, because his father was said to be a Glasgow grocer, and answered in his rapid daredevil fashion, "'No fun, isn't there just? That's all you know about it, my good fellow. Now I'll give you one example.' One day, the inspector came in and told us there were a lot of blacks camping out on our estate down by the Wardwadi River. So we jumped on our horses like a shot and went down there immediately and began dispersing them. We didn't fire at them because grass and ferns and things were very high, and we might have wasted our ammunition, but we went at them with native spears, just for all the world like pig-sticking. You should have seen those black fellows run for their lives through the long grass, men, women, little ones together. We rode after them, full pelt, as we came up with them one by one, we just rolled them over, helter-skelter, as if they had been antelopes or bears or something. By and by, after a good long charge or two, we cleared the place of big blacks altogether, but the gins and children, some of them, lay lurking among the grass, you know, and wouldn't come out and give us fair sport, as they ought to have done out in the open. Children will pack, you see, whenever they're hard-driven, exactly like a grouse, after a month or two of steady shooting, well, to make them start and show game. Of course, we put a match to the grass. In just a minute the whole thing was ablaze, right down to the corner of the two rivers. So we turned our horses into the stream and rode alongside, half a dozen of us on each river. Every now and again one of the young ones would break cover and slide out quietly into the stream and try to swim across without being perceived, and get clean away back into the country. Then we made a dash at them with pig spears, and sometimes they'd dive, the precious good divers they are too, those Queenslanders, I can tell you. But we waited around until they came up again, and then we struck them as sure as houses. That's what we call dispersing natives over in Queensland, extending the blessings of civilization to the unsettled parts of the back country. He laughed a pleasant laugh to himself quietly as he finished this atrocious devilish story and showed all his white teeth all in a row, as if he thought the whole reminisce exceedingly amusing. Of course, we were all simply speechless with horror and astonishment. Such a deliberate, brutal murderousness! Gracious heavens, what am I saying? I'd half forgotten for a moment that I, too, am a murderer. "'But what had the black fellows done to you?' Patterson asked with a tone of natural loathing, after we had all sat silent and horror-stricken in a circle for a moment. "'I suppose they'd been behaving awfully badly to some white people somewhere, massacring women or something, to get your blood up in such a horrid piece of butchery.' The merchant laughed again, a quiet chuckle of conscious superiority, and only answered, "'Behaving badly, massacring white women, Lord bless your heart. I'd like to see them.' why the wretched creatures wouldn't ever dare do it oh no nothing of that sort i can tell you and our blood wasn't up either we went in it just for by the way of something to do and to keep our hands in of course you can't allow a lot of lazy hulking blacks to go knocking around the neighbourhood of an estate stealing your fowls and fruit and so forth without let or hindrance it's the custom in queensland to disperse the black fellows i've often been out riding with a friend and i've seen one sulking about somewhere in the hollow among the tree ferns and i've drawn my six-shooter and i said to my friend you see me disperse that confounded one and i've dispersed him right off into little pieces too you may take your oath upon it 
but do you mean to tell me mr le merchant patterson said looking a deal more puzzled and shocked that these poor creatures had been doing absolutely nothing well now that's the way of all you home-sticking sentimentalists le merchant went on with an ugly simper you want to push on the outskirts of civilization and see the world colonized but you're too squeamish to listen to anything about the only practicable civilizing and colonizing agencies it's the struggle for existence don't you see the plain outcome of all the best modern scientific theories the black man has got to go to the wall the white man with his superior moral and intellect nature has got to push him there at bottom it's nothing more than civilization shoot him off at once i say and get rid of them forthwith and forever why i say looking at him with my disgust speaking in my face heaven forgive me i call it nothing less than murder le marchant laughed and lit his cigar but after that somehow the other men didn't care much to talk to him in an ordinary way more than was necessary for carrying out of the ship's business and yet he was a very gentlemanly fellow i must admit and well read and decently educated only there seemed to be a certain natural brutality about him under a thin veneer of culture and good breeding that repelled us all dreadfully from the moment we saw him i dare say we shouldn't have noticed it so much if we hadn't been thrown together so closely as men are on arctic voyage but then and there it was positively unendurable we none of us held any communications with him whenever we could help it and he soon saw that we of all of us thoroughly disliked and distrust him that only made him reckless and defiant he knew he was bound to go the journey through with us now and he sat to work deliberately to shock and horrify us whether all the stories he told by the wardroom fire in the evenings were true or not i can't tell you i don't believe they all were but at any rate he made them seem as brutal and disgusting as the most loathsome details could possibly make them he was always apologizing nay glorying in the bloodshed and slaughter which he used to defend with a show of cultivated reasoning that made the naked brutality of his story seem all the more awful and unpardonable at bottom and yet one couldn't deny all the time there was a grace of manner and a show of polite feeling about him which gave him a certain external pleasantness in spite of everything he was always boasting that women liked him and i could easily understand how a great many women who only saw him with his company manners might even think him brave and handsome and very chivalrous i won't go into the details of the expedition they will be found fully and officially narrated in the log which i have hidden in the captain's box in the hut besides the captain's body i need only mention here the circumstances immediately connected with the main matter of this confession one day a little while before we got jammed into the ice off the liakov islands le marchant was up on deck with me helping me remove from the net of creatures that we had dredged up in our shallow soundings as he stooped to pick out a leptocardium borale i happened to observe that a golden locket had fallen out of the front of his waistcoat and showed a lock of hair on its exposed surface le marchant noticed it too and with an awkward laugh put it back hurriedly my little girl's keepsake he said in a tone that seemed to me disagreeably flippant about such a subject she gave it to me just before i set off on my way to hammerfest i stared in some astonishment he had a little girl then a sweetheart he meant obviously if so heaven help her poor soul heaven help her for any woman to be tied to life to such a creature as that was really quite too horrible i didn't even like to think upon it i don't know what devil prompted me for i seldom spoke to him even when we were told off on duty together but i said at last after a moment's pause if you are engaged to be married as i suppose you are from what you say i wonder you could bear to come away on such long business as this when you couldn't get a word or a letter from your the lady you're engaged to for a whole winter he went on picking out the shells and weed as he answered in a careless jaunty tone why to tell you the truth doctor that was just about the very meaning of it we were going to be married next summer you see and for reasons of her papa's the deuce knows what my little girl couldn't possibly be allowed to marry one week sooner there i'd been knocking about and spooning with her violently for three months nearly and the more i spooned the more tired i got of it and the more she expected me to go on spooning well i'm not the sort of man to stand around billing and cooing for a whole year together at last things grew monotonous and i wanted an excuse to go off somewhere where there'd be some sort of fun going on till summer came and we could get spliced properly for she's got some tin too and i didn't want to throw her over but i felt that if i'd got to keep on spooning and spooning for a whole winter without intermission the thing would really be one too many for me and i should have to give it up from sheer weariness so i heard of this precious expedition which is just a sort of adventure i like and i wrote and i volunteered for it and then i managed to make my little girl and her dear papa believe that i was an officer in the naval reserve and i was compelled to go when asked willy-nilly it's only about half a year you know darling and all that sort of thing you understand the line of country meanwhile i'm saved the bother of ever writing to her or getting any letters from her either which is almost in its way equal nuisance i see i said shortly not to put too fine a point on it you simply lied to her upon my soul he answered showing his teeth again but this time by no means pleasantly you fellows on the cotopaxi are really the sternest set of moralists i ever met with outside a book of sermons or a surrey melodrama 
you ought to have all been the parsons every man jack of you that's just about what you're fit for on the fourteenth of september we got jammed in the ice and the cotopaxi went to pieces you will find in the captain's log how part of us walked across the pack to the lyakov islands and settled ourselves here on point sibiryakov in winter quarters as to what became of the other party which went southwards to the mouth of lena i know nothing it was hard winter but by the aid of our stores and occasional walrus shot by one of the blue jackets we managed to get along until march without serious illness then one day after a spell of terrible frost and snow the captain came to me and said doctor i wish you'd come and see la marchant in the other hut here i'm afraid he's got a bad fever so i went to see him so he had a raging fever fumbling about amongst his clothes to lay him down comfortably on the bearskin for of course we had saved no bedding from the wreck i happened to knock out once more the same locket that i had seen when he was emptying the dragnet there was a photograph in it of a young lady the seal oil lamp didn't give it very much light in the dark hut it was still long winter night on the liakov islands but even so i couldn't help seeing and recognizing the young lady's features great heaven support me uphold me i reeled with horror and amazement it was dora yes his little girl that he spoke of so carelessly that he lied to so easily that he meant to marry so cruelly was my dora i had pitied the woman who was to be harry lamarchant's wife even when i didn't know who she was in any way i pitied her terribly with all my heart when i knew that she was dora my own dora if i had become a murderer after all it was to save dora to save dora from that unutterable abominable ruffian i clutched the photograph in the locket eagerly and held it up to the man's eyes he opened them dreamily is that the lady you're going to marry i asked him with all the boiling indignation of that terrible discovery seething and burning in my very face he smiled and took it all in half a minute it is he answered in spite of the fever with all his old daredevil carelessness and now i recollect that they told me the fellow she was engaged to was a doctor in london and a brother of the parson by jove i never thought of it before that your name too was actually robinson that's the worst of having such a deuced common name as yours no one ever dreams of recognizing your relations hang it all if you're the man i suppose now out of revenge you'll be wanting to next go and poison me you judge others by yourself i'm afraid i answered sternly oh how the words seem to rise up in judgment against me at last now the dreadful thing is all over i doctored him as well as i was able hoping in all the time in my inmost soul for i will confess it all now that he would never recover already in wish i had become a murderer i was too horrible to think that such a man as that should marry dora i had loved her once and i love her still i love her now i shall always love her murderer as i am i say it nevertheless i shall always love her but at last to my grief and disappointment the man began to mend and get better my doctoring had done him good all the sailors though they did not love him had shot him once or twice a small bird of which we made fresh soup that seemed to revive him yes yes he was coming round and my cured medicines had done it all he was getting well and he would still go back to marry dora the very idea put me into such a fever of terror and excitement that at last i began to exhibit the same symptoms as lamarchant himself had done the captain saw i was sickening and feared the fever might prove an epidemic it wasn't i knew that mine was brain lamarchant's was intermittent but the captain insisted upon disbelieving me so he put me and lamarchant into the same hut and made all the others clear out so as to turn it into sort of a temporary hospital every night i put out from the medicine chest two quinine powders apiece for myself and lamarchant one night it was the seventh of april i can't forget i woke feebly from my feverish sleep and noticed in a faint sort of fashion that lamarchant was moving about restlessly in the cabin lamarchant i cried authoritatively for as surgeon i was of course responsible for the health of the expedition go back and lie down upon your bearskin this minute you're a great deal too weak to go and get anything for yourself yet go back this minute sir and if you want anything i'll pull the string and patterson'll come see what you're after for we had fixed a string between the two huts tied to a box at the end as a rough means of communication all right old fellow he answered more cordially than i had ever yet heard him speak to me it is all square i assure you i was only seeing whether you were quite warm and comfortable on your rug there perhaps i thought the care i've taken of him has made him feel really a little grateful to me so i dozed off and thought nothing more at the moment about it presently i heard a noise again and woke up quietly without starting but just opened my eyes and peered around as well as the dim light of the little oil lamp would allow me to my great surprise i could make out somehow that lamarchant was meddling with the bottles in the medicine chest perhaps thought i again he wants another dose of quinine anyhow i'm too tired and sleepy to ask him anything just now about it i knew he hated me and i knew he was unscrupulous but it didn't occur to me to think that he would poison the man who had just helped him through a dangerous fever 
At four, I awoke as I always did, and proceeded to take one of my powders. Curiously enough, before I tasted it, the grain appeared to me to be rather coarser and more granular than the quinine I had originally put there. I took a pinch between my finger and thumb, and placed it on my tongue by way of testing it. Instead of being bitter, the powder, I found, was insipid and almost tasteless. Could I possibly, in my fever and delirium, though I had not consciously been delirious, have put some other powder instead of the quinine into the two papers? The bare idea made me tremble with horror. If so, I might have poisoned the marchant who had taken one of his powders already, and was now sleeping quietly upon his bearskin. At least, I had thought so. Glancing accidentally to his place in that moment, I was vaguely conscious that he was not really sleeping, but lying with his eyes held half open, gazing at me cautiously and furtively through his closed eyelids. Then the horrid truth flashed suddenly across me. The marchant was trying to poison me. Yes, he had always hated me, and now that he knew I was Dora's discarded lover, he hated me worse than ever. He had gotten up and taken a bottle from the medicine chest, I felt certain, and put something else instead of quinine into my paper. I knew his eyes were fixed upon me then, and for the moment I dissembled. I turned around and pretended to swallow the contents of the packet, and then lay down upon my rug as if nothing unusual had happened. The fever was burning me fiercely, but I lay awake kept up by the excitement until I saw that he was really asleep, and then I once more undid the paper. Looking at it closely by the light of the lamp, I saw a finer powder sticking closely to the folded edges. I wetted my finger, put it down, and tasted it. Yes, that was quite bitter. This was quinine, no doubt about it. I saw at once what Lamarchet had done. He had emptied out the quinine and replaced it with some other white powder, probably arsenic. But a little of the quinine still adhered to the folds in the paper, because he had been obliged to substitute it hurriedly, and that at once had proved that it was no mistake of my own, but that Lamarchant had really made the deliberate attempt to poison me. This is a confession, and a confession only, so I shall make no effort in any way to exculpate myself for the horrid crime I committed the next moment. True, I was wild with fever and delirium. I was maddened with the thought that this wretched man would marry Dora. I was horrified at the idea of sleeping in the same room with him any longer. But still, I acknowledge it now, face to face with a lonely death upon this frozen island. It was murder, willful murder. I meant to poison him, and I did it. He has set this powder for me, the villain, I said to myself, and now I shall make him take it without knowing it. How do I know that it's arsenic or anything else to do him any harm? His blood be upon his own head, for aught I know about it. What I put there was simply quinine. If anybody had changed it, he has changed it himself. The pit that he dug for another, he himself, shall fall therein. I wouldn't even test it, for fear I should find it was arsenic and be unable to give it to him innocently and harmlessly. I rose up and went over to Lamarchant's side. Horror of horrors, he was sleeping soundly. Yes, the man had tried to poison me, and when he thought he had seen me swallow his poisonous powder, so callous and hardened was his nature that he didn't even lie awake to watch the effect of it. He had dropped off soundly, as if nothing had happened, and was sleeping now, to all appearance, the sleep of innocence. Being convalescent, in fact, and therefore in need of rest, he slept with unusual soundness. I laid the altered powder quietly by his bed, and took away his that I had laid out in readiness for him, and crept back into my own place noiselessly. There I lay awake, hot and feverish, wondering to myself hour after hour when he would ever wake and take it. At last he woke and looked over toward me with unusual interest. "'Hello, doctor,' he said quite genially. "'How are you this morning, eh? Get along well, I hope.' It was the first time during all my illness that he had ever inquired after me. I lied to him deliberately to keep up the delusion. "'I have a terrible grinding pain in my chest,' I said, pretending to writhe. I had sunk to his level, it seems. I was a liar and a murderer.' He looked quite gay over it and laughed. "'It's nothing,' he said, grinning horribly. "'It's a good symptom. I felt just like that myself, dear fellow, when I was beginning to recover. Then I knew he had tried to poison me, and I felt no remorse for my terrible action. It was a good deed to prevent such a man as that from ever carrying away Dora, my Dora, into a horrid slavery. Sooner than he should marry Dora, I would poison him. I would poison him a thousand times over.' He sat up, took the spoonful of treacle, and poured the powder, as usual, into the very middle of it. I watched him take it off a single gulp without perceiving the difference. Then I sank back, exhausted, upon my roll of sealskins. All that day I was very ill, and Lamarchant, lying tossing beside me, groaned and moaned in a fearful fashion. At last the truth seemed to dawn upon him gradually, and he cried aloud to me, "'Doctor, doctor, quick, for heaven's sake, you must get me out an antidote. The powders must have gotten mixed up somehow, and you seem to have given me arsenic instead of quinine, I'm certain.' "'Not a bit of it, Lamarchant,' I said with some devilish malice. I've given you one of my own packets that was lying here beside my pillow. 
he turned white as a sheet the moment he heard that and gasped out horribly that that why why that was arsenic but he never explained it in a single word how he knew it or where it came from i knew i needed no explanation i wanted no lies so i didn't question him i treated him as well as i could for arsenic poisoning without saying a word to the captain and the other men about it for if he died i said it would be by his own act and if my skill could avail he should have the benefit of it but the poisons had had full time to work before i gave him the antidote he died by seven o'clock that night in fearful agony then i knew that i really was a murderer my fingers are beginning to get horribly numb and i'm afraid i shan't be able to write much longer i must be quick about it if i want to finish this confession after that came my retribution i have been punished for it and punished terribly as soon as they all heard the marchant was dead a severe relapse i called it they set to work to carry him out and lay him somewhere then for the first time the idea flashed across my mind that they couldn't possibly bury him the ice was too deep everywhere underneath it a layer of solid rock of the bare granite islands there was no snow even for wind swept it away as it fell and we couldn't do much as decently cover him there was nothing for it but to lay him out upon the icy surface so we carried the stark frozen body with its hideous staring eyes wide open out by the jutting point of the rock behind the hut and there we placed it dressed and upright we stood it up against the point exactly as if it were alive and by and by the snow came and froze it to the rock and there it stands to this moment glaring for ever fiercely upon me whenever i went in or out of the hut for three long months that hideous thing stood there staring me in the face with mute indignation at night when i tried to sleep the murdered man stood there still in the darkness beside me oh god i dared not say a word about it to anybody but i trembled every time i passed it i knew what it was to be a murderer in may the sun came back again but still no open water for our one boat in june we had the long day but no open water the captain began to get impatient and despondent and as you will read in the log he was afraid now we might never get a chance of making the mouth of lena by and by the scurvy came i have no time now for details my hands are so cramped with cold and then we began to run short of provisions soon i had them all down upon my hands and presently we had to place patterson's corpse beside the marchants on the little headland then they sank one after another sank of cold and hunger as you will read in the log till i alone who wanted least to live was the last left living i was left alone with those nine corpses propped up awfully against the naked rock one of the nine men i had murdered may heaven forgive me for the terrible crime and for pity's sake whoever you may be keep it from dora keep it from dora my brother's address is in my pocket-book the fever and remorse alone have given me strength to hold the pen my hands are quite numbed now i can write no longer there the manuscript ended heaven knows what effect it may have upon all of you who read it quietly at your home in your own easy chairs in england but we of the search party who took these almost illegible sheets of shaky writing from the cold fingers of one solitary corpse within the frozen cabin of the liakov islands we read them through with such mingled thrill of awe and horror and sympathy and pity as no one can fully understand who has not been on an arctic expedition and when we gathered our sad burdens to take them off for burial at home the corpse to which we gave the most reverent attention was certainly that of the self-accused murderer. End of The Search Party's Find by Grant Allen